Dearly Father, we're just thankful for the day. Thank you, bless you for giving us another beautiful week. I thank for the rain that we had. We, we, we were short on rain. Just thank you for that. Uh, thanks for the students that are here. Just pray you keep them healthy, help them keep them safe. Uh, hope them have a good weekend. It's, it's being Friday. Uh, we have the weekend coming up. Just pray you bless them, help them in their weekend, Lord. Just give us a good day today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so your homework was to read section 18a. All right, wasn't very long. Uh, what was it? All of one, two, three, three and a half pages. And it answer questions two through eight. Two through eight. All right, number two, why do atoms form chemical bonds? Why do atoms form chemical bonds? Yes? Okay, and so how do they, how do they get, how, how do they obtain that eight valence electrons? Sharing or uh, gaining or losing electrons. Okay, very good. All right, number three, what is the octet rule? Yes? Okay, uh, there are really three more atoms that had the exceptions just be uh, besides hydrogen and helium, all right? Uh, really, there's going to be hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron. All five of those will have the, that exception. Because when we look at lithium, we just look at lithium here. All right, here's a more model of lithium. All right, it would either need to have seven more or to lose the one to get a full valence shell electron. If it loses one, it only has two. All right, and lithium will lose the one because of this electronegativity. Same thing when we look at beryllium. There's beryllium with two. Well, it's going to lose the two instead of gaining the six. And here's boron with a three. Well, it's going to lose the three instead of gaining the, gaining the five. All right, and... Ultimately, all of them will only have two valence electrons at the end. So the exception to the octet rule will be the first five atoms. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron. Uh, so you, you may want to write that down in that, on that question uh, if you don't have it already. Now those five atoms. Number four, what are the two ways that atoms can acquire a full outer energy level? Two ways that atoms can obtain a full outer energy level? I mean, really, really probably three. Sharing, gaining, and losing. But right. gaining and losing kind of go together because of the gain from that makes it a little more. Correct, yes. Uh, so uh, so that's why they would say two, but there's, I, I think it's three. Losing, gaining, or sharing. As long as you have all three. Uh, number five, what, pro what basic properties of atoms determine how easily they can attract and hold electrons. What basic, basic property of atoms determine how easily they can attract and hold electrons? Taylor? Electron affinity. Electron affinity. What does it mean when this property has a negative value? When this value has a negative value? Yes? Why? Well, what does the value mean? What, what does it mean? What, 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 why does that become negative? What does that mean? I heard that uh, when it fuses together, kind of the element, it gives off energy. All right, so it's giving off the energy, so the energy uh, is usually in a negative form. Yes. So it gets more stable that way. Uh, number six. What is the difference between electronegativity and electron affinity? What is the difference between electron affinity and electronegativity? Yes? Electron affinity is when it's unbonded, and electronegativity is when it's bonded. Correct. Okay. They're both basically the same thing, except one is when they're bonded. So electron affinity is basically the tendency for an unbonded atom to attract an electron. Electronegativity is the tendency for a bonded atom to attract an electron. Number seven. Name and briefly describe the three basic bond types. 
All right, the three basic bond, bond types are what? Taylor? All right, covalent, ionic, and metallic. I want to describe briefly the three different types. What about ionic? What is that? What does is, what is it mean by ionic? Yes? Between um, metals and non-metals. Okay, what else? Yes? When atom takes on the full control of all the electrons. All right. Anybody else? Ionic, yes. I have in an atom of higher the high electronegativity leaves the electron to become the high one, whereas in the electron to become the down one. You're close. It's really the the atom that has low electronegativity loses the atom and becomes a cation. Alright? So what's happening to the electrons? And we'll talk about this today. They're being transferred. Given or shared. Alright? So if I, if I give you money, then I transfer that amount of money to you now, and, and you, you have it now. So that's what happens to electrons to be transferred. Covalent, what's happening? What, what's described briefly the covalent? It occurs between non-metals. All right, two non-metals. What's happening to electrons? The sharing. The sharing. All right, and metallic? It occurs between... All right, so it occurs between two metal atoms, and they are sharing electrons as well. Uh, so there's the three basic bond types. Number eight, the type of chemical bond between atoms often determines how many or many of the chemical and physical properties of an element or a compound, true or false? Anyone? True, it is true. Okay, it is true. All right, pass those forward, please. and sentence form with the question. Okay, so you write them all in sentence form with the question and decide your answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no more pencils. Too hard to read. All right, take out your notes, please. Yesterday? No, we okay. Okay, no problem. Very good. All right. So, again, bonding and compounds, what we're talking about in Chapter 18. Uh, we're going to talk completely about bonding. And the very first thing we need to understand is why do atoms bond? And again, through your reading yesterday, uh, you basically got the idea of why atoms bond. Because as on the periodic table, we have 118 atoms. All right? They are shown by themselves, but they're hardly ever by themselves in nature. The only ones that are by themselves in nature are the monatomic atoms, which are our noble gases. Everything else would be the diatomic or polyatomic, uh, and they are also bonding with other elements. Why is that? Because they are unstable by themselves. I showed you in class the potassium, the lithium, and the sodium, how it reacts to water, uh, but you wouldn't find that chunk of sodium in nature, walking along the ground, oh, there's a chunk of sodium. Because right? sodium is always going to be with uh, some other type of element. So we bond because we want to be stable. 
To become stable, we must have a full outside energy level of electrons. What atom bond to become stable? How? Full valence shell of electrons. Normal rule. What's that rule? Every atom desires to have eight valence electrons. Every atom desires to have eight valence electrons it is the octet rule. Each atom desires to have eight valence electrons to become stable. There are some exceptions to the rules that we mentioned in our homework. Our exceptions. Hydrogen and helium can only have two. If they only have one energy level. First energy level can only hold two electrons. So hydrogen and helium only has one energy level, so they can only get two. But if they have two, then they're full. So therefore, they're stable. If they have two, if they have two they're stable. All right? The other ones are lithium, beryllium, and boron. When losing, we'll have a full first energy level. We'll have a full first energy level, as we showed in the uh, beginning of the class of the homework uh, with the Bohr model. And again, uh, because they're metals, because they have a low electron affinity, they do not attract electrons. They actually actually lose electrons uh, when they do that. Uh, so uh, those are ex exceptions. Now. On our periodic table, we had three classifications of, of elements. And what are they? Three classifications of elements. Yes? Metal, non-metal, and metalloid. All right, so we got metals. We got non-metals. And we got metalloid. Most of our metals would have what, how many valence electrons? Most of our metals would have how many valence electrons? One to four. Most of our non-metals will have? Two. Our non-metals? Most of our non-metals will have? Eight. Mm, most of our non-metals will have five to eight. And really, we could say metals one to three, but a lot of them have four. There's some that have four as well. All right. So if we want to have eight, again, most most things in nature want to do is find the easiest path path possible. We want to find the easiest path possible. If we have a task to do, we're always looking for the easiest way to do it, and not the hard way to do it. 
Uh, and atoms are no different. They're looking for the easiest way. They want to get a full valence shell electron total of eight. So a metal that has one to four, they have two choices to do. Say like for instance, a metal that has one valence electron can either gain seven or lose one. But what's going to be easier? Losing one. A metal that has three, it needs either to gain five or lose three. What's going to be easier? Gain three. No, that's it. That's it. Did I say it backwards? If it has three valence electrons, it needs to gain five or lose three. So what would be easier? Lose three. Lose three. So most of our metals are always usually losing or sharing electrons to get their valence electrons, their full octet. When we look at a metal, a, a non-metal, a non-metal has five to eight, so if we have one that has five valence electrons, it needs to lose five or gain three, which is easier. Gain three. If we had six, we would gain two. If we had seven, we would gain one. If we had eight, we don't have to gain anything. So five to eight valence electrons will either share or gain. And a lot of this is not necessarily because it's easier, because of some of the other properties that we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but again, if we're metals, we're losing. If we're non-metals, we're usually gaining. And again, uh, we kind of help each other out here, because if I'm a non-metal with a metal, uh, the non-metal says, hey, I need an electron, but you don't really need it, because you, it's better for you to lose it than for you to keep it. And so therefore, I said, you give me your electron, and you will be satisfied, and then I'll be satisfied, and then we are, we are compatible. Uh, again, what happens when an atom loses an electron? Reaction. There is a reaction, but what, but what happens to the electron? Or what, what happens to the atom? Negative. What's that? Negative. Becomes, Negative. if it loses, Negative. becomes positive because we have more protons. If an atom gains electrons, now it becomes negative. negative. So what happens to opposite charges? They attract. They attract. So they combine with each other, so they bond to each other. And so that's how we start new start with our bonding. So because why do atoms bond? They become they want to become stable. How do they become stable? They get a full valence shell of electrons. The normal rule is the octet rule. Each atom desires to have eight valence electrons. All right, there are some exceptions. Hydrogen and helium. They can only get two. So, but if they have two, they have a full valence shell of electrons. Uh, lithium, beryllium, and boron, again, when they lose, because they're metals, they will lose. Uh, they lose that outside energy level, so they have the inside energy level is already full. Uh, metals are usually losing or sharing. Non-metals are usually sharing or gaining. All right, so there's two principles here that we want to look at. Electron affinity and electronegativity. These kind of play hand in hand. They're usually, basically, they somewhat are the same, but they're not the same. But somewhat they're the same. Now, do you remember we our atoms are made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Protons are positive, electrons are negative, and we know that opposites attract. So there's an attraction between the protons and the electrons. How strong that attraction is depends. And we talked about a trend, atomic size. As we go left to right on the periodic table, all right, the atomic size is doing what? What's, the, what's happening to the size of the electron? Getting smaller. Getting smaller. Why is it getting smaller? Because there's more electrons that's produced and which makes a uh, greater attraction. Greater attraction. So there's a greater attraction the further right that we get. Because there's a greater attra attraction, if there is a spare electron that comes in the area, because of that greater attraction, the tendency to grab that electron is greater as well as we go left to right. Electron affinity
is the tendency of an unbonded atom to track an electron. And they have a measurement for this, and usually they measure this, so this is the measurement. So as we go left to right, the atom gets smaller and smaller, so the electrons are getting close, to the outside energy level is getting closer to the, uh, to the nucleus. So as we get closer to the nucleus, that, that charge, that opposite charge coming in, all right, and again, we want to have eight to be full, gets stronger. So the electron affinity, the tendency of the atom to attract an electron gets stronger as we go from left to right. So it builds up. Electronegativity, though, is the ability of a bonded atom to attract and hold electrons. So they're almost the same definition, they're almost the same terminology. The only difference is one is unbonded when an atom is by itself, and one is bonded when one is bonded with another atom. So that also increases as we go left to right. But when we look at the electron affinity and electronegativity, groups 8A, group 8A are noble gases. How many electrons do they want? Nothing. They don't want anything. They're already full. So the measure of their tendency to attract an electron is zero. They don't want anything else. They don't need anything else. So they don't bond, so the ability of a bonded atom, so electronegativity negativity is also zero. So my electronegativity and electron affinity actually stops at halogens. Fluorine, fluorine is my bully of the atom. Fluorine is the highest electronegative element there is. If anything comes in the presence of fluorine, fluorine is going to steal its valence electron. Because electron affinity is so high. Its electronegativity is high. It will steal the electrons or share it. And we'll look at the difference in the sharing in just a few minutes. Yes, sir. So wait, if you put alkali metals with fluorine, would that make a big reaction in water? Well, again, water is a compound, so there's a reaction of switching electrons with it. So fluorine combining with an alkali metal, is there going to be a reaction? Not necessarily going to be a reaction, but there's going to be a bonding. Okay. There's going to be a bonding. And later on, we'll see in the chemical equations and the reactions uh, what we're talking about there. But usually it's when a compound combines with a compound, there's a reaction mm -hmm. or a single atom. So, basically, with what we saw before with sodium, the reaction was when, oops, this happened. When the atoms are switching up uh, because of their characteristics. So there's the reaction. Not necessarily when that happens because that hap that will happen that would, that possibly would be normally in nature as a compound. Now, if we if we would take this and put it with something, then something could happen. But usually, with fluorine, fluorine is not going to fluorine is not going to get kicked out uh, because it's so so reactive and high uh, electronegative that there's nothing else higher. So, if you have the king of the mountain and he's the strongest. And he's the biggest, all right? Doesn't matter who comes up the mountain, it's not going to win. Because the, the king is just going to knock him back down. Uh, so he won't be removed from the top. That's the same thing with fluorine. Fluorine very rarely gets removed from any, any compound that it's with. Uh, so nothing, nothing can actually kick it out uh, naturally. 
uh, normally a chemical. Now we can do it man-made, so we can separate sodium and fluorine and get sodium by itself, uh, but naturally it will not happen. So there's electron affinity and electronegativity. Now, what causes our bonding is the difference in electronegativity. The difference in electronegativity. If the difference in electronegativity is high, electrons transfer. You got two kids coming to play with the same toy. If the difference in their strengths and their size is big, usually one wins and the other one loses. And which one wins? All right, the strong one, the big one. Okay, so there's a transfer of that toy. That the small kid you don't have the toy anymore. The big one does. If the difference in electronegativity is low, then electrons are shared. <laughs> Two boys of the same size, same strength, come and fight for the same toy. Or they take, for instance, the basketball court, you get you get both two guys fighting for the same ball, all right? Nobody wins. They both hang on to the ball. All right? So they're basically sharing the ball. Or on the other direction, if we got two people that are weak coming up and fighting for the same ball. Well, most likely they both share the ball too because nobody wins either. So the difference in electronegativity would determine what happens to the electron. If we have a high uh, electron affinity, a high tendency to attract an electron, we usually have a high electronegativity, a high ability to hold on to that electron. That's usually what happens. So they kind of go hand in hand. All right, kind of go hand in hand. All right? The Noble gases have no electron, electron affinity because they already have eight. They don't have a tendency. They don't want to have the eight because they already have the eight. Uh, they don't have electronegativity because they already have the eight. Uh, so there's not, nothing to do to both hanging on uh, to an electron that they bond. All right? So let's look at the different types of bonds. First one is ionic transfer of electrons. That means one loses, one takes. One loses, one takes. If we have a transfer of electrons, that is because a difference, a high difference of electronegativity. That means one has a high and one has a low electronegativity. What usually has a high electronegativity? Uh, halogen. All right, which are? Super seven eight. Which are? Classification. Nonmetal. Nonmetal. Which has a low electronegativity? What usually has a low electronegativity? Uh, metal. Metals. So ionic compounds or ionic bonding occurs between a nonmetal and a metal. Because the difference in electronegativity is high. One has low, one has a high electronegativity. Occurs between a metal and a nonmetal. So therefore, Remember, our metals are on the left-hand side, our non-metals are on the right-hand side. Sodium chloride in ACL, what type of bonding is occurring? Electro... So what type of bonding? Ionic. Ionic. 
The sodium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal. Magnesium fluoride. What type of bonding is occurring? Uh, I don't know. Because fluorine is a nonmetal, magnesium is the metal. So fluorine wants the electrons. It wants to steal the electrons from magnesium. Fluorine is the bluey. Covalent bonding. We have a tight sharing of electrons. Usually when you have a similar electronegativity, and the electronegativity is high. Because if it's a tight, that means that we have two strong people fighting for the same toy. So it's tight. What has high electronegativity? Non-metal. So we usually happen between a non-metal and a non-metal. So for instance, H2O. Two non-metals. So we have covalent bonding. Take uh, CO2, carbon dioxide. All right, two nonmetals, so it's covalent bonding. All right, covalent bonding, what's happening? It's tight sharing of electrons. How did that happen? Because we have similar high electronegativities in between a nonmetal and a nonmetal. All right, so there's some examples. And then finally, we get metallic. Metallic, exactly what it says between two nonmetals, is a loose sharing of electrons. Between a metal and a metal. And again, metals have what type of electronegativities? Low electricity. They have a very low tendency to attract electrons. So if they see an electron, if we hit two, two metals, they see that electron, they won't want it. Alright? So they grab it, but it's very loose, though it's not a very tight sharing because uh, one of them really can't hang on to it for very long. So they keep on going back and forth, back and forth. I got it, you got it, I got it, you got it. Uh, because there's no there's no strength there. So usually a similar Electronegativity low. A metal and a metal. Yes, sir. Oh, what does that say? The third one. Loose sharing and a metal and a metal. What's the name of it? Metallic. M E T A L L I C. Metallic. Um, yes, sir. Why did you put like the delta on some on like the on the top? Because a delta usually means difference. difference. So a difference, uh, a high difference of electronegativity, so one low, one high. Here, these are similar, so there's not really a difference. So they're basically the same. Okay. So that's, that's the difference. So AG, so let's say we have a chunk of silver. All right, we write the chemical formula AG, but it doesn't mean just one atom, it means a bunch of atoms, a bunch of AG atoms, a bunch of metal atoms. Have both have low, so they're sh loosely sharing the electrons. All right, we could have a uh, you know gold. Normally, you would see them uh, as a compound written by themselves. If we see them written together, they're really not a compound because they're really usually mixed together, not not combined together. But we could see like that: AG, AU. A mixture of gold and silver. 
in a compound, uh, that would be metallic as well. And we'll learn about that, that type of bonding. So we got ionic, covalent, and metallic bonding. Uh, so you can, uh, those are the three types that we're going to be talking about. Now, there is hardly, there is usually not a pure ionic compound or an ionic bond. Because there's not necessarily a complete transfer of electrons. Even though, yeah, I'm taking your electron away, this atom still has some type of relationship with that electron. Uh, so, and we'll talk more about that uh, Monday as well. So we're going to stop there uh, for this. Uh, so that kind, of, that kind of fills in what we talked about on section 18A. Uh, you're going to have a quiz again on Tuesday with the third column. Quiz on Wednesday on vocab, correct? All right, very good.